So the big picture is that Britain was losing the French and Indian War in North America. And we need to figure out why that is, because it was weird. It was weird, first off, just when you consider the numbers. There were 1.6 million British colonists in North America versus only 90,000 Frenchmen. Right, with that sort of numerical advantage, this war shouldn't have been close, right? It takes special a special level of gutlessness and inefficacy for 1.6 million people to lose a war to 90,000 people. Now, before we talk about that, um, I do want to observe um, why there were so many British and so few French. Um, you know, the British model of colonization was to clear Indians off the land and farm, right? So that's 1.6 million British farmers, mostly, in the 13 colonies in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. The French model of colonization was very different, right? The French are mostly building, uh, you know, trading posts uh, sprinkled across um, what's now Quebec, uh, French Canada, and the Ohio country. And, you know, that, that model of colonization, uh, you know, trading, you know, engaging in fur trade with the Indians, doesn't require a, a critical mass of people, right? So you've got this skeleton crew of French fur traders um, versus legions of British farmers. And what's funny is the skeleton crew of French fur traders is winning. Key French advantages included unity, right? Well, while the colonists have rejected Franklin's Albany plan of union, the British colonists, the French are working together to fight this war, and uh, turns out unity uh, works really well. Not only are, are the French good at coordinating with one another, they're excellent at coordinating with their Indian allies, and of course, the overwhelming majority of Native Americans in North America are um, working with the French, so that's a major advantage. And as we saw at Monongahela, the French have adopted Indian tactics for wilderness fighting, and that um, also is an advantage. Now, we need to understand uh, the British disadvantages, and um, the they all come back to the 13 colonies, right? Just like the 13 colonies disliked the Albany Plan of Union because they didn't want to raise taxes, um, the individual 13 colonies refused to raise taxes, even during a war. Now, this is bizarre, right? For most of human history, wars, um, you know, countries raise taxes during war because wars are expensive. And so the, the belief that you can successfully prosecute a war without raising taxes, that's weird and delusional. But that's where the 13 colonies were at that time. Also, the colonies were were not coordinated. They weren't working together. The, you know, for example, uh, think back to Washington's defeat at Fort Necessity. Now, part of the reason they lost, of course, is they were outnumbered. Now, Fort Necessity happened happened to be on land that was part of Pennsylvania, um, claimed by Pennsylvania at least, and knowing this. The um, Virginia militia had, you know, months before asked Pennsylvania to send some forces. So, um, you know, to help um, with this. And the government of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's elected leaders, the Colonial Assembly, they considered this. Um, and, you know, their first question was, well, this place that they're going to be fighting for is it really in Pennsylvania? So they um, they put Benjamin Franklin in charge of a committee to figure out if um, this French Fort Duquesne was in fact in um, in Pennsylvania. The committee studies the matter, and they Franklin and his committee report back: yes, in fact, this place, Fort Necessity, uh, well, Fort Duquesne, where the French were, um, is in western Pennsylvania. So we should send troops. The legislature incredibly votes to reject the findings of Franklin's committee so that they won't have to send troops. And, you know, this is representative of what's going on in the French and Indian War, which is that colonies are happy to let other colonies do the fighting, 
they're not going to uh, help one another. They're not going to, um, you know, everyone, instead of everyone trying to pull their own weight in this war, everyone's trying to let other people do the work for them. Um, as I mentioned before, colonial militias were pretty inept. I mean, these were part-time armies, right? These are uh, citizen soldiers with day jobs who have limited training and, you know, as for weapons, they're mostly just bringing whatever musket they happen to own at home, which, um, you know, wasn't always up to the job. Also, uh, colonial militias saw their job as defending their colony, not going outside the colony to do any fighting. Now, that makes sense on some level, but it also is a bad idea, um, given that in this war... The goal is to conquer French territory. It's to take the Ohio country from the French. It's to take Canada from the French, Quebec. And you can't conquer other people's land without entering it. And if you're refusing to leave your colony, if you're only playing defense, there's no way you're going to um, be able to conquer anything. Right? You, uh, if you won't cross the 50-yard line, you're never going to score a touchdown. No, um, on the right, just a really cool uh, and fairly accurate depiction of Native Americans during the French and Indian War. On the left, a key figure here, a new leader in Parliament. His name was William Pitt, and it is he who cracks the code. It is he who figures out how to uh, snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, who manages to turn the tide in the war. And he does it by being realistic. Pitt recognizes that 13 colonies are not going to tax themselves. The 13 colonies are not going to uh, raise, you know, are, are not going to create an effective army out of their militias. Pitt figures Britain has to do it for them. And so they do. Um, the British raise taxes on British people back in Britain. And load thousands of British forces on, you know, uh, you know, British people from Britain, soldiers, um, on ships, take them 2,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean, land them in French Canada, that's what's happening here, um, you know, the ship has brought British soldiers all the way from Britain, and they're getting off the boat, and they're marching in, and fighting the French, this is a um, big... Uh, battle for control of uh, Quebec, the um, the major French uh, settlement there. So with British troops ferried in from Britain, and you know British tax dollars, uh, the British win. This is uh, General Wolfe, the um, the uh, great British general, uh, mastermind of the victory in Quebec, and so victory is achieved. Not by the colonists, but by the grace of British troops and British taxpayers. The Treaty of Paris is the agreement um, between Britain and France and other countries to end this war, which leads, as you can see in the map, to major territorial changes. Right before the war, all this green stuff had been claimed by, by France. Um, right, New France or Quebec up here in Canada, and then the Ohio country. Right, this was originally what the colonists wanted to fight for, and the Louisiana Territory, which was vast. Well, under the terms of this treaty, France is erased from the, ma from the mainland of North America. The Ohio country, this land between the Appalachians and the Mississippi, is now British. Quebec, French Canada, is now British. And New Spain uh, enlarges to consume the bit of Louisiana west of the Mississippi River. The only thing France holds on to in North America is Haiti, uh, which of course was the most valuable uh, possession because Haiti was a major sugar producer. Right? France was making far more money from Haitian sugar than they were making from uh, the fur trade in North America. So... They, they kept the part that mattered most to them. So Britain has gained the Ohio country, 
and Britain has gained Quebec. And this time, you know, here at the end of the war, the British are in a more generous and sensible mood. Instead of, you know, like earlier in the war, they conquered Acadia and they um, expelled the Acadians. But now the British decide that the Quebecois, the French-speaking residents of Quebec who had uh, established this network of fur trading uh, posts, you know, throughout French Canada and down into the Ohio country, the British decide to let those fur traders stay. Um, Britain says, hey, look, if you just want to maintain your business relationships with the Indians and, you know, uh, keep doing what you've been doing, but now do it for Britain instead of doing it for France, uh, well, if you're willing to do that, you can stay. And the Quebecois said, we, oui, we will stay and continue doing business with the uh, with the Indians, continue making money for the fur trade. It doesn't bother us that we're now working for Britain instead of France, um, as long as we can you know, keep our lives. So that's what happened. The This is how you say uh, Quebecois. I mean, the, it, the spelling is weird because French is weird, um, but the... Um, the people who, the French fur traders, the folks, French-speaking residents of Quebec are the Quebecois, and that's how you spell Quebecois. All right, so the colonists are psyched, right? The 13 colonies are are so happy about this victory. They um, erect statues of the new king, George III, right? Old George II had died during the war. His, his son, George III, uh, crowned during the war, and so after the war, to celebrate this great victory around the 13 colonies, they put up statues of the new King George III. Note that he is depicted here as a conquering Roman Caesar or emperor, because that's how the colonists and the rest of Britain felt, that, you know, Britain has arrived. Britain is now the superpower. Just as Rome dominated the ancient world, the British are now dominating the modern world, which to us is the early modern world, um, but to them was obviously contemporary. Uh, Fort Duquesne, uh, that area, now that it's British, um, develops into a frontier town named for William Pitt, right? The leader of parliament who uh, masterminded uh, the victory. So the colonists are, you know, patriotic uh, members of the British Empire and you know they they pay appropriate respect to the king appropriate respect to the leaders of Parliament but weird um, the colonists also give themselves credit for this victory now that's weird because the as I mentioned before, uh, colonial governments were cheap and didn't, you know, refuse to raise taxes to finance the war, uh, refused to build their militias into effective armies. Their militias mostly stayed home. Their militias, when they saw combat, weren't very effective. And yet, you know, the the myth of colonial competence stemming from outlier events like the Battle of Monongahela convinced the colonies that they had somehow earned this victory. Now, this damaging delusion, this false notion that the colonists deserved the lion's share of the credit for the victory in the French and Indian War, this is going to sow the seeds of, dis of disputes between the British and the colonies. Because um, the British know what really happened. The British know that the colonies didn't pull their weight in the war and that you know, British taxpayers and British soldiers saved the day. More on... Um, the disagreements that uh, stem from these, this disagreement over what happened in the French and Indian War next time. Thanks, everybody.